Professor Mark Howden is the Director for the Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions at the Australian National University. He's also an Honorary Professor at Melbourne University, a Vice Chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and is the Chair of the ACT Climate Change Council. He was on the US Federal Advisory Committee for the third National Climate Assessment, was a member of the National the Australian National Climate Science Advisory Committee and contributes to several national, major national and international science and political advisory bodies. Mark has worked on climate variability, climate change, innovation and adoption issues for over 30 years in partnership with many industry community and policy groups via both research and science policy roles. Issues he's addressed include agriculture and food security, and uh, the natural resource base, ecosystems and biodiversity, energy, water and urban systems. Mark has over 420 publications of different types. He developed, helped develop both the national and international greenhouse gas inventories that are, that are a fundamental part of the Paris Agreement and has assessed sustainable ways to reduce emissions. He has been a major contributor to the IPCC since 1991 with roles in the second, third, fourth, fifth and now sixth assessment reports, sharing the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with other IPCC participants and Al Gore. Well, in that, uh, with, with that, let me, uh, and please join me in welcoming to the stage, Professor Mark Howden. Uh, th thanks, Chris, for that introduction, <clears throat> and also thanks to the organisers for the opportunity to be here today. And, and just before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on who we stand, which is the Bidjigal and Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. So what I'm just going to cover here is, is largely just a bit of uh, uh, an update on the recent climate science, particularly relating to the IPCC Working Group 1 report, which was released in August, uh, and then sort of linking into some issues relating to uh, energy and energy transitions here in Australia. And, uh, and so it's drawing on the work of many people uh, in this uh, presentation. The, the first thing I, I guess I focus on is that uh, in spite of all the rhetoric about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we're not. So this is uh, a graph of carbon dioxide emissions, which is the single biggest uh, human uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, and we can see that that's going up. This is actually the, <clears throat> a graph of the fossil fuel and cement manufacturing type emissions. To, there's also another about six gigatons of emissions coming from uh, land clearing similar sort of sources. But, um, so if, but if you look at this particular source of emissions, which is the biggest one, you can see essentially it's gone up exponentially. A few little blips here and there, such as the global financial crisis, a much bigger blip with COVID, uh, with the lockdown. Uh, but what we're seeing already is a bounce back um, from COVID. And I anticipate that next year's emissions will be higher um, than they were pre-COVID. So, so we're not actually getting to the point where we're reducing emissions uh, to the extent that we need. And the extent that we need is dramatic. We have to go from up here on this, whoops, uh, um, up here on this graph um, and down, uh, not just, it's not about leveling it off. So leveling carbon dioxide emissions off does not solve climate change, is that um, what we have to do is take it down to zero, which means we have to go from here right down <clears throat> to pretty much on the floor on this graph and really, really big changes. So if we think that we had a lot of change with the, with the COVID period where we had lockdown and reduction in tra travel, that's a very, very small part of what we need to do over the next decades. In fact, if we keep on the sort of reductions in COVID, like that was about a 5% reduction, 5.5% reduction last year, and we keep on doing 5.5%, it actually takes us pretty much to where we need. So that's a sort of, in a sense, a bit of a taste of what we need to do. The, the problem was, COVID generated behavioral responses, you know, I'm not driving to work because I can work from home type responses, not structural responses, which is um, let's change the nature of our vehicle fleet, let's change the nature of energy systems. And so, so what we're left is uh, a lot of pain, but no gain at the end of COVID. And so, so in fact, this blip here um, essentially buys us about three and a half weeks of time before we actually hit 1.5 degrees. So that's, that's as, as much as COVID has done in terms of climate change. Uh, 
So the reason why we have to take it to zero is because when we emit carbon dioxide, which is a really long lived and well mixed greenhouse gas, well mixed means it just ends up everywhere across the globe. So you need a ton here in Randwick and eventually it will be in, in Nigeria and Iceland, etc. So, um, so we actually have to take that down to zero because when we emit a ton of carbon dioxide, roughly speaking, a quarter of it gets taken up by the oceans fairly quickly and a quarter gets taken up by the land, that's the trees and grass and soils, but half of it sits in the atmosphere and it'll sit in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. And so that builds on the, the residue, the half that was left over from last year and the year before and the year before. So it just builds up, it accumulates. So the only way you can stop it from accumulating is essentially take it to net zero. So that's why you hear all of the rhetoric about net zero by 2050 and all those sorts of things. And because we're still emitting billions of tons of carbon dioxide, it's not surprising that this is accumulating in the atmosphere. We're seeing the atmosphere concentration go up. So currently it's around 417 parts per million. When I was born, it was 317 parts per million. And so it's gone up that 100 ppm in my lifetime. And, and pre-industrial, it was about 280. So we're really mucking around big time with the carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. And we know from physics studies going back to the 1800s and, uh, and paleo studies going back millions of years, that if we increase carbon dioxide, we also increase temperature. So it's not surprising that we're seeing changes in, uh, in our atmosphere, which will relate then to changes in temperature already. But it's... Um, when we actually look at that carbon dioxide record, um, at the moment, that 417 is, is higher than it's been in at least the last 2 million years. So this is, you know, highly unprecedented. So humans as a species, we've been around, roughly speaking, 200,000 years. Um, there's no time in our history where the carbon dioxide has been anywhere, anywhere near this level. And that's, um, and it's not just carbon dioxide, but it's also methane and nitrous oxide and various other things that we muck around with um, and produce lots of through gas extraction and various other things. So because we know that um, those carbon dioxide and methane levels are, are greenhouse gases, they keep temperature in, heat in that otherwise would escape out to space. So that was worked out in the 1800s. It's not new science. Um, it's not surprising we're seeing the temperature go up. So this is global temperatures across the globe from the, the, again, that IPCC report. What this shows is the best estimate of the natural influences, um, which come from things like solar radiation variation. So the sun's radiation goes up and down, uh, you know, how much we receive on earth at diff different times, but particularly volcanic variation. So when we have a volcano, it puts up lots of particulates in the atmosphere, uh, which cools the earth and it reduces the amount of sunshine received by the earth. So if you've got solar panels sitting under a volcano, they're not going to be working as well because that sunlight never reaches them. But when we add the human influence to that, uh, we see a really significant component of, of increase. So the gap between the natural and the human plus natural is very significant. So it's a clear human fingerprint on this and it corresponds very closely with the observed temperatures, which is those ones there. And when we look at the global decadal temperature, so a 10 year average temperature, um, it's about 1.1 degrees above the pre-industrial average. Uh, and, uh, and most recent years have been up to 1.24 degrees above the pre-industrial average. So last year was the hottest, equal hottest on record, for example. This year, because of La Nina, will be about the sixth hottest on record. Um, so we won't be right at the top, but in the absence of, of that uh, La, Nina, La Nina, we'd be pretty much up there. Um, and in fact, it's not just things like La Nina, which keep the uh, you know, climate a little bit colder, but also massive amounts of pollution. So if you look at East Asia, South Asia, particularly these days, we're getting lots of particulate pollution, um, aerosol pollution, which keeps that temperature down in those regions uh, and hence the global temperature down. And it's quite significant. So the number would have been about, for global warming, be about 1.5 degrees in the absence of that air pollution. Now, of course, that air pollution does other things, including making solar panels um, less effective because, again, the sunlight never reaches them. And what we're seeing because of these changes uh, is that we're already seeing things like sea level rise, which is accelerating. We're seeing ice sheet breakdown and glacial breakdown right across the globe. We're seeing increased heat stress events, uh, which have, amongst other things, significant Im impacts on energy demand, um, droughts and fires. And I'll go into some of this in a minute. What's happening on Australia maps exactly what's happening across the globe. So we see this sustained increase in temperatures, 
particularly in the last so about seven decades, um, going up and up. Um, just a couple of years ago, we were extraordinarily hot. This was the black summer period. Um, and you can see that that was you know, pretty much off the chart. Um, this year will be quite considerably colder because of the La Nina and the rainfall we've been receiving. So rainfall means there's lots of cloud. Cloud means sunshine doesn't heat the earth. It means your solar panels are less effective. Um, it means there's lots of water around to evaporate. And so that cools the, the land surface as well. So we're seeing these sorts of changes in Australia mapping very closely what happens across the globe. Now, what might happen in the future? So these are the uh, emission scenarios coming out of the IPCC. Um, so this is uh, going ranging from very high to very low emission scenarios. Um, at the moment, we're sort of tracking across this one here. Um, maybe we take this big dip down here. Um, maybe not. Depends on what the globe decides to do. If we're, what we're looking at, though, is I've sort of put indicative end of century temperatures here against those scenarios. So just to give you a feel. And if we, if we go on the high, very high scenario, which probably is unlikely at this stage, um, we end up with about five degrees uh, hotter conditions. Now, five degrees may not sound like a lot, but five degrees is the difference between our historical temperatures and the last ice age, except obviously in the opposite direction. It's five degrees of warming instead of five degrees of cooling. Uh, the last ice age fundamentally changed the face of the Earth. Like it was, it's a seriously non-trivial um, amount of temperature change. Um, our Glasgow commitments, um, so these are the commitments made at Glasgow, somewhere between about 1.8 and 2.7, depending on how you interpret the assumptions you make subsequently there. But three, three degrees, which may sound better, is still two thirds of an ice age worth of temperatures. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a good thing to be aiming for. If we actually want to meet the Paris Agreement goals, which is temperatures somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degrees, we got to go on either the low or very low emission scenarios, which means taking things down to net zero by about 2050 for the very low and 2070 for the low scenario. So there's um, 1.5 degrees is consistent with taking to net zero roughly by 2050. Really importantly, um, you, we then have to actually go below zero. So to keep temperatures down, it's not just hitting net zero, that's only half the story. We then have to go below zero. And we have to go below zero in a way um, that stores carbon dioxide, takes it out of the atmosphere and stores it somewhere safe. And that takes a lot of energy. And that energy can't, by definition, come from fossil fuels. It has to come from renewable resources. So if you look at this graph, this gap here is a massive opportunity for renewables and particularly for solar. And so this is one of the messages that the public never sees. You know, that, you know, you hear about net zero as though net zero is the goal, it's the end point. And it's absolutely wrong. Net zero is a waypoint. It's part of the journey. It's not the end of the journey. And I think that journey has massive opportunities um, for renewables. What does this mean in terms of temperature? Because that graph was in terms of uh, emissions. Um, this is exactly the same scenarios, um, going from the very low to the very high, but in terms of temperature over time. And for, for those emission scenarios, including the one we seem to be on, uh, that all of them take us above 1.5 degrees by the 2030s, and the high emission scenarios take us to over 1.5 degrees before the 2030s. So it could actually happen this decade. Um, and so the good news coming out of this, though, is if we do stick to the very low emission scenarios, which means massive decarbonisation of our systems, we can very gradually start, we can limit climate change to 1.5 and then start bringing it back. So there's a very, very slight decline sitting in that part of that scenario. It's not huge, but it's there. And so, so the hope here is if we stick to that really very low scenario, um, that we can actually turn around climate change. Not all of its impacts, but at least the temperature side of it. And to do that, we have to um, decarbonize at a huge rate. So this is what we call the carbon budget. So a carbon budget is like any other budget. If you've got a certain amount of money, you can spend it in different ways. You can spend, you know, if you've got a weekly budget, you can spend it quickly and then run out of money halfway through the week and then starve for the rest of the week. Or you can spend it sort of steadily through the week and you can actually survive. And the carbon budget is exactly the same. So what this is, is <clears throat> essentially the amount of carbon dioxide we can produce and still stay, be consistent with either 1.5 degrees or two degrees. So, and, and this is to give different probabilities. So it's a probability distribution. It's not a number. 
Um, but if we want a two thirds chance of sticking to 1.5 degrees, we can only emit roughly speaking 400 gigatons more of carbon dioxide. Now the problem is we're already emitting um, something like uh, 42 gigatons of carbon dioxide each year. And so if you do the simple maths, you know, that tells us roughly speaking, we've got 10 years at current rates of emissions before we've completely blown that budget that's consistent with 1.5 degrees. So that's where one of the threads of argument where that 10 years comes from, you know, that you hear in the media that, you know, we've only, you know, this is the critical decade. And the only way we can meet that budget is starting to push down our, our carbon dioxide emissions, particularly from energy, um, and do that really quickly uh, if we're to keep within that uh, emissions budget. And at the moment, we're not doing that, as I showed you in that first slide. So what does this mean in terms of temperature and rainfall and similar things across the globe? So, uh, so if we look at temperature, um, so um, this, is, this is what the world would look like, a scenario of, of four degrees. You can see that if you're, if you're a Pacific Ocean Island, you warm up um, less quickly than if you're in the Arctic or the Antarctic or the center of continents. And the areas around the edges of continents against the coast warm up um, uh, more slowly than in the center, center of the continent. So there's a temperature gradient across that. Um, there's also changes in rainfall, which I won't go into in great detail, except basically to say that, particularly in the southern part of Australia, we're likely to have lower rainfall, um, possible increases in the north and northwest, um, but it's, uh, it's uncertain there. Now, these, these changes will actually affect energy supply and transmission, and they'll affect energy demand, they'll affect uh, the way in which we adapt our systems. And I'll just go into that briefly here. So, so if we actually look at energy supply, so this is the ability of our, our systems to actually push energy into our electricity system in this case, that clearly in a drying climate, um, which we have already in Southern Australia and which is projected to get worse, we're going to have less hydropower. So, which is actually a significant part of our energy mix here in Australia. And, and similarly, if we're relying on pumped hydro, uh, it increases the losses from pumped hydro. So if you've got water sitting in dams, you increase that loss, um, your daily evaporation rate. So on a hot day, you can lose about 10 millimetres of water from a, a dam. Um, so, so you can lose a lot from the dams. So it's not just a recirculating thing. You have to top those things up and you'll have to top it up more frequently as you get hotter. Um, our coal and gas uh, power stations, which we currently sort of rely on, um, uh, are going to be derated. So they produce, they're less efficient under hot conditions. Um, and we have outages increase, so their reliability reduces and their availability of water for cooling decreases in a drying climate. So coal-fired power will become more problematic um, it, you know, in spite of everything else, but just because of climate change, it's going to become more problematic. If you look at solar PV, um, as you'd know, there's uh, the temperature coefficients of solar panels means that a solar panel that's hot is less efic efficient than one which is cooler. And under hotter climates, we're going to lose some of that um, potential energy. So there was a recent study here in Australia which looked at what that might mean. Um, and we can see that uh, depending on, uh, you know, this is the sort of historical baseline type uh, um, potential and then changes in the near future and the further, you know, several decades out. And you can see by and large across Australia anticipated <clears throat> reductions in uh, solar PV um, uh, potential across Australia. This is in part due to reduced solar radiation in some places and at some times because that changes over time, um, but also because of uh, temperature effects on uh, cell efficiencies. So um, our PV um, will be affected by climate change itself, um, assuming our current sort of technologies which have significant temperature coefficients. So if we're also looking at temperatures um, and uh, there's significant losses which increase uh, as temperature goes up in our transmission lines. And so, so if you have transmission lines which are above ground, um, they heat up a lot more and we have significant losses in, in the up to several percent uh, on hot days and that's projected to increase. So if you've got a, a, a bunch of solar panels um, sitting out in the middle of the Northern Territory or out in Western New South Wales with long transmission lines, climate change is actually going to reduce the efficiency of that transmission to where the power is used. Um, if we look at uh, severe weather, which is already increasing and likely to increase more under climate change. So, you know, this is the, um, the uh, picture from that event, which uh, you know, blew down the connector to South Australia some years ago. 
and cause a lot of political uproar, um, that's likely to increase. So our disruptions across our transmission lines are likely to increase due to higher top wind speeds um, and more storminess. Um, we're likely to see also increased fire risk, and this is already happening. So that's that sort of picture there. And this is a really big issue in some places like California, where um, PG&E uh, essentially went bankrupt because of the threats of fire in California and uh, associated with their power transmission. So they're looking to put, I think it's 10,000 miles in their terms of, um, of cables, of transmission cables underground to stop this you know, massive expense, but that's the value proposition of avoiding that increased fire risk. And we see that a um, very recent study, Pep Canadell and others um, did, which looked at uh, fire risk in Australia. So this is how it's already changing. Um, and we can see that historically uh, our fire risk, this is the area burnt. Um, if you look at the summer period, traditionally our, our um, fire risk period in Australia, it's essentially going up linear with 2019 uh, 20, um, you know, pretty much off the chart. Um, if we look at the cool season, so the out of season fire risk, um, that's the autumn and winter period where historically very few fires have occurred and not very significant ones. And we can see that's essentially going up exponentially. So um, summer fires increasing sort of roughly linearly, but, uh, but those cool season fires increasing exponentially. So we're actually entering into a period where for a lot of Southern Australia, fire risk is not a season, it's a year. <clears throat> it happens at any time of the year. <clears throat> and we can see that there's been really significant changes already in terms of fire risk um, in this map. If we look at the demand side, uh, which is also um, critical and impacts on uh, sort of demand for PV, um, is uh, what we see is the demand for energy, generally speaking, is likely to increase. Uh, so as we electrify everything, the demand for energy um, is going to increase. So, and you'd know that well. Um, and, uh, but there's also an interplay with the different emission scenarios. So the faster we um, sort of, uh, you know, decarbonize, um, the more, in a sense, the more electricity we're going to have to produce. If we look at things like um, air conditioner penetration, uh, what we see across the globe is this becoming more and more important. So essentially people in hot climates or even hot climates for part of the year, if they can afford air conditioners, they will buy air conditioners. It's, it's becoming a, a, a normal part of, of sort of human comfort. And you can see in various places that, that penetration, which is essentially now 100% in many places. And we see that um, obviously that's going to, um, the demand for um, air conditioning uh, power will uh, change with temperature. And so these are some scenarios uh, done a few years back. Um, you should look at places like Sydney, where we are now, um, two, two degree scenario, four degree scenario, really significant changes in energy demand, largely driven by that air conditioner demand. But very different. Uh, uh, scenarios for different places. So cooler environments, not so much change. And so that's that balance between winter heating and summer, summer cooling in terms of the annual demand factor. But also if we're in a, a hotter and drier climate, we'll need to irrigate more um, and we'll need to um, desalinate more, um, you know, such as the Sydney desal plants and most of our capital cities now have desal and all of those will require energy and and if we're smart, we can really tie um, sort of intermittent uh, you know, uh, energy production such as PV to these. So you don't have to um, pump your irrigation 24 hours a day. You can just do it during your peak um, production period. You don't have to desal 24 hours a day. You can tie it into your peak production period. So, so that sort of, um, you know, you're not having to have 24 seven power actually in a sense can deliver really, really cheap power to some of these um, systems which currently require quite expensive power. If we're to respond to these things, there's lots of ways in which we can respond uh, in terms of our energy system. So, so obviously there's sort of a whole range of technical responses, which includes putting uh, power underground, as I mentioned before, um, increasing pole height if you're doing uh, transmission cables, so taking it out of the fire zone if you're worried about fires. Um, you know, changing the temperature response of PV panels, so reducing your temperature coefficient and different technologies have different uh, uh, temperature coefficients and, you know, essentially temperature proofing some of your systems. You can have systems planning, so actually doing a good job of integrated planning, which we still yet to do here in Australia. Um, standards, uh, which take into account climate change, 
um, smart grid technologies, which take into account that sort of climate driven temperature demand and supply, um, diversification of energy, energy supplies, etc. When various studies have looked at the sort of ability to adjust our systems uh, to the future, um, uh, what they generally tend to find is that if we're starting off with an existing system, uh, diversification is actually a much better way to go um, in your system. So diversifying the, the locations of supply and the, and the, the sort of uh, um, timing of supply rather than just sort of beefing up your existing system. So it's uh, essentially suggesting redesign of our systems rather than tweaking of our systems um, is most appropriate in terms of climate change. Now, the last slide here um, is, because I wanted to leave a bit of time for questions, is um, just what we've done here in ANU, because the, the um, uh, organisers wanted me just to cover this. Uh, at ANU, uh, we used to have three sort of institutes covering this ground. Uh, we had the Climate Change Institute, Energy Change Institute, and the Disaster Risk Science Institute. We've, about a year ago, we brought those together. Um, I'm the director of that. And we also, uh, within my institute, we also host what we call the ANU Below Zero uh, Initiative, which is aiming to take ANU to net zero by 2025 and below zero by 2030. And the below zero is really important because that's what the science says. It's not net zero isn't your target, it's actually below zero is your target. So what we're trying to do is have an initiative which actually does what the science says needs to be done. done. So across those different areas, there's about 500 affiliated uh, researchers within ANU. Um, so uh, someone suggested the other day, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a, you know, a town hall meeting for a couple of days of the researchers? And I said, well, maybe the vice chancellor might get a bit worried about such a huge slice of the researchers across ANU being taken out of the system for a few days. But it does actually emphasize how um, uh, you know, incredibly uh, spread through the university, the sort of attention is to these different components. And, and I suspect if at New South Wales Uni or one of the other big unis, you'd find similar numbers. You know, there's a very, very large number of people who in one way or the other engage with these topics. And the, the intention of this very simple diagram, the simplified diagram, is, is basically just to reinforce what I've been talking about in this presentation is that energy interacts with climate and energy interacts with disaster risk and energy interacts with our achievement of emission reductions. And, and all of these things interact with, with each other. So we're looking to <clears throat> maximize the synergies between these different areas. So that's the overlaps are really important parts of the picture to occupy. So I'll just leave it there, um, but thanks again very much for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, fantastic presentation, Mark. Um, how about, uh, there's, there's a little bit of time for questions, uh, not a lot. Are there any questions from the room? Uh, so I have Alistair at the back. Come on, Alistair. Thanks very much, you, um, leave your, I know Alistair will, but leave your mask on if you have a question. Thanks, Renata. Mark, thanks so much for your talk, very interesting. Um, and good to be reminded of all of these things. Um, just to, a recent uh, event happened in uh, detecting methane off coal uh, coal mines, etc. There was a discussion in the media. Just wondered if you could comment on the accuracy of those recent measurements as reported in the in the media. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so uh, thank, thanks. Um, the, the way our, our uh, emissions from coal mines have been calculated in the past is essentially what we call an activity-based assessment. So if you have a coal mine which is uh, this deep and digging up this much coal, uh, so that's exposure of new, new material, uh, then there's a coefficient that essentially is used to calculate the methane emissions. Uh, we've actually known for quite some time that uh, that's actually underestimating, um, probably by about a factor of two, um, the emissions. And uh, and so when those satellite uh, sort of analysis came through, um, it was not surprising to people who have been in, sort of engaged in that topic uh, that, that give, gave bigger estimates. The, the, the challenge here is to sort of integrate um, that, that satellite measurements with those, uh, the activity-based inventory approach um, so that we actually get better um, estimates, which are temporally um, and spatially diverse. So, so you can have coal mines, uh, uh, you know, relatively adjacent to each other, which have actually quite different amounts of methane being produced. Um, deep mines tend to produce a lot more than shallower mines, et cetera. So 
So we need the sort of that granularity to get best rest, better estimates. Uh, I have one question, if I may. Okay. Um, yep. You talked about the the um, the possibility of using excess solar for desalination, or you know, I can imagine for carbon capture. <laughs> um, do you know if anybody's ever done a study of capital efficiency? Because a lot of this plant you can't have sitting around for, you know. 15 hours waiting for the sun well you can but the the cost of capital you know um under, undermines the economics of doing it do you know if anybody's ever studied that uh not so much for sort of irrigation or desal um but in other areas people have certainly looked at that and mm. uh, and assessed uh, whether whether in fact your curtailment sort of price uh, prices uh, um, you know do generate um, efficiencies which are um, you know, sufficient to offset that, you know, part-time yeah. use of, of capital. Yeah. Um, and, and oftentimes the answer is it's a bit marginal. Mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges, of course, is that uh, that, um, that that curtailment, in a sense, is, is going to grow as, as, our, as our proportion of solar PV grows. Um, but also the opportunities to use that, I think, will grow significantly as well. So, um, so if we go, you know, pumped hydro with, you know, snowy hydro, then, you know, there's an opportunity to use a, a lot of, of that extra um, mm. energy at times. Um, I actually think it's, it's, a, it's a, a massive opportunity for Australia to think how to effectively use um, uh, that energy, which otherwise would be curtailed. And um, this is just to throw this back at you, is that one of the questions is, um, for me, is if you do curtail uh, solar PV, say from the household uh, um, roofs, does that then um, increase your roof temperature um, uh, and then uh, increase uh, your, your air conditioning um, load? And, and so... Alistair knows the answer. Have we got time for an answer to that one, Chris? Yeah. Uh, we'll quick, if it's quick. It's Alistair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alistair, be quick. I can be quick. Um, one degree temperature rise if you curtail the uh, panels, and if your roof is insulated, it should have minimal impact on your air conditioning. Excellent. Right. Okay, so, thank you. So there Fantastic. you go. So, so it's a pretty minor thing, but those, those, those are the sorts of things you need to actually have some information on. And, um, and so, so you can actually communicate that. Um, Ideally, what we'd actually be moving is to is housing stock, which is essentially passive housing stock, which is actually isolated um, from from your environment, and your your demand for energy goes down tremendously, uh, both in summer and in winter, uh, and your your air quality will increase, particularly in periods of high fire. So we need to that that's just an example of how we need to think about this in a much more integrated way. It's not just about energy system; it's about our whole of our system and understanding where really positive leverage points are. All right, so that was a, a terrific presentation, Professor Howden. Uh, there are a couple of questions online that I'm not going to go to just in the interest of time. That just goes to show the advantage of actually being there in person. Uh, and I'm sure that the people in the room will be uh, pestering Mark at the, at the coffee break, but it's time we should, uh, well, let's join me in thanking Professor Howden for a fantastic presentation.